the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. I'm glad to be back in your city, your congregation, and even to be asked to serve you with the word of the Lord. Dear friends, keeping in mind the central, most central word of our Bible, which Jesus tells us today, I am the, the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. We may realize while there are many ways, it takes a conscious decision in any given situation to opt for Jesus' way. And while there are many truths, it takes an open mind and a courageous heart to stand up for Jesus' truth. And while there are many lifestyles, it takes wisdom and faith to believe in the life, of Je the, in the life Jesus has assumed and into which he promised us to transform our lives as well. A college professor, an avowed atheist, while teaching his class, flatly stated he was going to prove there was no God. Addressing the ceiling, he shouted, God, if you are real, then I want you to knock me off this platform. I'll give you 15 minutes. The lecture room was in a huff. Ten minutes went by. And again, he taunted God, saying, Here I am, God. I'm still waiting. This countdown got down to the last couple of minutes when a Marine, just released from active duty and newly registered in the class, walked up to the professor, hit him full force in the face, and sent him tumbling from his lofty platform. He was out cold. The class, being shocked and babbling in confusion, fell silent again, waiting. Eventually, the professor came to. He looked at his punchy student and asked, What's the matter with you? Why did you do that? He told him, God was busy. He sent me. How often would you... How often would I have liked to suck somebody because he made fun of our faith or made us look dumb? This young Marine turned undergraduate is our hero, I guess. Doesn't he show how God deals with those who spurn him? I wonder if Jesus had someone like him in mind when he said, whoever believes in me, will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. However, reading the Gospels, I cannot find that Jesus dealt with people by knocking them out cold. Acting peaked and violent and vindictive is what humans come by naturally. There is nothing spiritual about it. It actually could be the attitude of any incensed Muslim burning the American or German flag and any pro-lifer shooting, like happened May 2009 in Wichita, Kansas, a doctor who was known to perform abortions. Jesus, however, wants his faithful to act so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Behaving violently in God's name, even for the right reasons, is exploiting faith as a seemingly legitimate way of self-assertion. The only time Jesus is reported as acting violently, though it probably was a symbolic deed, was in dealing with the merchants and money changers in the temple. He chased them out because they were exploiting religion for their own ends. He deemed it derogatory if faith in God, whom he called Father, 
was turned into a robber's ethics or a profit and market oriented ideology. On the other hand, he did not castigate the unbelievers. Instead, he submitted to being taunted and beaten and betrayed and falsely accused and whipped and crucified by them. Because on the cross, he anchored God's love even for them and irrevocably in our world. Henceforth, his believers are to be known by it. Jesus said as much in John 13, verses 34 to 35, which actually is some sort of preamble to the gospel reading that we heard this morning. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Jesus' way to God, which he calls us to follow, loving one another like he loves us. Jesus' truth about God, which he wants us to stand up for, the Father's glory, not ours or anyone's person. Jesus' life in God, which he has promised us, doing his works and even greater ones. What then should a true-blooded Christian do if a professor or any other person at our places of work or study is mocking God and everything which is holy to us? The text relates Jesus' answer, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Obviously, we should talk with Jesus about it and then see what he has us do so that God may be glorified. The power of prayer. Uh, no, I take that back and rather speak of the promise of prayer. I find it necessary to make this distinction since some power-minded TV and mega churches make what I feel a mockery of prayer and which becomes because they have this outlet of TV all pervasive even among Christians which is easy to do for everyone of course to make a mockery of prayer. Imagine a father who every time he sits down at family meals grumbles about the food and then asks the blessing. Now his small son is very observant and asks him, Daddy, does God hear us when we pray? Of course, Daddy replies, he hears us every time. The child then asks, does God hear everything else we say? And Daddy answers guilelessly, yes, son, God hears our every word. Upon which the little wise guy delivers his punchline. Then which does God believe, what we say in prayer or what we say before we pray? The child realized that his dad's prayer did not take God seriously because how could God bless food which dad had already judged unsatisfactory? Many televangelists do the same, I feel. They judge what they have been given unsatisfactory. Therefore, they employ a kind of think positive gospel, if gospel it can be called. They encourage their followers to claim what is supposedly theirs in the first place. By what has been termed the law of attraction, they simply have to wish or pray for what they feel they are entitled to, a well-paying job, a Rolex, a rake off at the raffles, even finding a parking space or getting out of a speeding ticket. One gets the feeling that some people striving for political office also seem to think along these lines. If their faith wish is strong enough, it will be given them. 
One preacher encourages his fans to use the technique also in crowded restaurants. If you can say, Father, I thank you that I had favor with this hostess and she is going to sit me soon, to seat me soon. What he actually thinks is, God, I am unhappy about the delay being imposed on me. I am starving and I want to eat soon. This is to be remedied pronto. One wonders, how can God bless if we have judged the situation already to be an injustice to us? In this type of thinking, man does not perceive himself as sinner anymore. Supposedly, he is on God's side all the time. Therefore, he thinks he can boss God around. This morning, I skimmed the funny pages and, and uh, hit on Hagar the Horrible. He's a special friend of mine. Um, and Hagar is throwing a coin into a wishing well. His friend Sven asks him, what did you wish for? And Hagar says, I wished that I could magically lose 50 pounds. A great laugh issues from the wishing well. Well, Hagar, of course, hates that. But I have the feeling, somewhat like this, God may laugh about people who try to make him, make him their puppy, the puppy of their wishes, by, um, by a law of attraction or whatever law they may conceive of which is outside of what the Jesus himself tells us as his gospel. The promise of prayer, in contrast, is based on our accepting reality. It may be hard on us in times of illness or hardship, or be won only through a lengthy process of praying until we grow from resistance to submission. Then, however, it may result even in taking, in thanking God for it, trusting him to open up for us possibilities and surprises which he, we had never in mind but become aware of as soon as we have our accepted our lot. There is something of the resurrection in this. We are dying, as it were, to old dreams and are rising to new realities. Martin Luther, in the small catechism, teaches about the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer, Give us this day our daily bread. What does this mean? Answer, God gives daily bread, even without our prayer, to all wicked men. But we pray in this petition that he would lead us to know it and to receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. Dear friends, we remember that Martin Luther took daily bread to be everything that belongs to the support and wants of the body. Jesus' way to God, which he calls us to follow, accepting reality as the place where he is going to reveal himself. Jesus' truth about God, which he wants us to stand up for, the Father's providing for all our needs. Jesus' life in God, which he has promised us, our being blessed even in and through adversity. One day, a lady told a radio counselor, I was born blind and I have been blind all my life. I don't mind so much being blind, but I have some well-meaning friends who tell me that if I had more faith, I could be healed. According to the well-meaning friends, healing the blind lady would be automatic if only her faith were strong enough to demand, even trigger, her being healed. In positive thinking, God actually has no choice but to do as he is bidden. People 
who believe like this behave callously towards others. They betray the signature love by which Christians are recognized as Jesus' disciples. How did the counselor deal with the blind woman's issue? He asked her if she carried one of the typical white canes. When she confirmed it, he advised, the next time someone tells you to have more faith, hit him or her on the head and say, if you had more faith, that wouldn't hurt. I don't agree with the advice, but, but share the radio counselor's exasperation. However, his suggestion illustrates what happens as soon as Christians start dealing in more faith or less faith, serious faith or weaker faith, true faith or shallow faith. They get into a fight. The faith trigger happy Christians probably would tell even Jesus, if he, he had had more faith, he would have avoided the cross. Obviously, it is a winner's faith, and the losers be damned. The chronically ill and disabled who cannot pay their doctor's bills, people who can't feed their family on what income they make on the job, professional women in, man, in a man's world being hampered in their careers, all minorities in societies which have their way of life and culture geared exclusively to the majority's needs. If there is no acknowledgement of the cross, there is no love. And as the laugh is always on the loser, the winners add insult to injury. If you had more faith, you could be healed. By making him thus responsible for his bad fortune, they are denying him even the comfort of God's love. Jesus' way to God, which he calls us to follow, taking our cross and that of others to his cross. Jesus' truth about God, which he wants us to stand up for, the Father's compassion. Jesus' life in God, which he has promised us, sharing in his resurrection. I am glad to report, therefore, that God's love in the crucified Christ is irrepressible. In spite of its detractors, who seem to be mainly interested in their own well-being and for others have cold comfort at best, God's love makes itself known because when serving oneself is ruling supreme, there usually is someone who serves others in love. When hating others is considered imperative, there usually is someone who reminds others of love. When impatience, be impatience becomes a way of life, there is usually someone who patiently, together with others, works for love. When the cross of Jesus is being denied, there usually is someone who is an example for a commitment to love. When indifference for others' needs is widely accepted, there usually is someone who identifies with Christ's lesser brothers and sisters for the sake of love. When the unfortunates in society are declared culprits, there usually is someone who demands justice for them in the name of love. When love is scorned as weak and ineffectual, there usually is someone, someone living from the resurrection life of Jesus, changing the world to love. This someone may be you. This someone may be me. Often this someone is bearing his cross. Often he is not easily recognized. Whoever this someone is, who lives Christ's love, he is encouraged and will be strengthened by Christ's word. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. Being with the Father and also present among us through his Spirit, 
Jesus will not let his love wear off or disappear ever. But he counts on you and he counts on me. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.